part three, specifically chapter 13, but we're dealing with packet switching and networking technologies. Uh, this chapter we're focusing on packet switching, packet technologies uh, that are used by guided and unguided media, or wired versus wireless. Like I said, specifically chapter 13 deals with our LANs, our local area networks, our packets, our frames, and our topologies. So before we get like super in depth, uh, packet versus frame, what's the difference? So when we start talking about our different layers within the OSI model, seven layers, and we focus on layers one, two, and three for our physical, so those are what deal with our physical devices. At layer one, we're dealing with hardwired medias, or bits. On layer two, our da data link layer, we're actually dealing with our frames. And then on layer three, our network layer, we're dealing with our packets. Uh, packets and frames are just ways of encapsulating data. So conceptually, if you think of a envelope and you stick something in the envelope, that's encapsulation. And then you stick that envelope into another envelope, that's just another layer of encapsulation. So in this example, we could have data put into a packet, the packet put into a frame. That's just one uh, letter envelope, the first envelope into the second envelope, and you got the concept. This chapter focuses on circuit switching, packet switching, local and wide area packet networks, our different types of IEEE 802.x standards, our topologies, uh, then we're going to start getting into some packet identification, multiplexing, demultiplexing, addressing, uh, frames and bits and bytes versus bits and whatnot. This is actually one chapter that should be multiple chapters. That's a lot of information, so this might be a little bit longer than normal. So we start off with chapter 13 very specifically because it examines packet switching technologies. So I know I just said packet switching, but we're going to talk about circuit switching and then packet switching. Because one, we can't understand one without the other, and we can't understand why we went from the older one to the newer one. So circuit switching refers to a communication mechanism that establishes a path between a sender and receiver. So our old phone systems, dedicated pathways between our sender and our receiver. Though this guaranteed isolation from the path used by other senders and receivers, it's just realistically we can no longer dedicate specific is uh, isolated paths for all of our senders and all of our receivers. It's just no longer realistic. Uh, you see this, or you've seen this predominantly within the cable company. When you picked up your telephone, you dialed the number, it should only be you and the other end on that line if it was working correctly. So instead of having a physical hard wire between one uh, sender and all possible receivers, they did what was called a virtual circuit. And that is, you connect to a centralized office location, and that centralized office location had some type of switchboard to another centralized office to help kind of virtually give you that dedicated link, even though there was not a specific hardwired link. Here is an example, conceptually, of our circuit switching. More specifically, uh, our circuit switching was uh, broken down into a few different areas, which is point to point. That means, again, uh, isolated from one another. 
separated steps for circuit creation and use and termination. So basically we're distinguishing our circuits that are switched, i.e. only established when they're needed from circuits that are permanent. And the performance uh, equivalent to the isolated physical paths, uh, as well as the cost associated with individual isolated paths. So, let's move on to packet switching. So, packet switching actually allows us to share a media. So, instead of having to do multiple paths, we can actually just share one wire. And then how we communicate on that shared wire is what's important. On our shared wire, we can actually chunk up our conversations so that we can put multiple communications or multiple conversations on one wire. Uh, it's basically, instead of trying to have one large package, we can actually ship several smaller packages a lot easier. Then it goes into, well, what if one gets lost? With this type of packet switching uh, design, because it's broken up in manageable chunks, if one packet gets lost, we can just resend the small packet. We don't have to send to the entire thing. Now, for voice communication, this doesn't really work well, but for other forms of data communication, it works well, very well. A packet switch system requires the senders to divide the message or break the message up into blocks of data known as packets or packages. Uh, because again, a packet is also a layer 3 term used for that envelope. And that's why I call them packages, not packets, uh, because you can, they're both referred to as packets, it's just confusing for a lot of people. The nice thing here is, this is all done by our equipment. So then the next question then becomes, well, who controls the sending and receiving? What happens if one computer is sending more than the other? Uh, how do we actually chop up that one media? So there's one way. I'm looking specifically at the fifth bullet point. Performance varies due to statistical multiplexing uh, among packets. So basically, we can have a statistical analysis performed where that we analyze all the PCs and what they're sending and then we allocate a PC with one more uh, one additional block extra than other ones because they send more. Our goal is to maximize the efficiency of what we're putting on that data link or on that wire. If let's assume we have three people and our three PCs all trying to communicate, we can actually do it in a round robin way. First PC1, then PC2, then PC3, then back to PC1. But what happens if at a given point PC2 has nothing to send? So for that time that PC2 has that stick, that wire is not transmitting anything. That's no longer efficient. That's actually why we have our statistical multiplexing method. I apologize for that. I have, I have the hiccups right now. Ooh. So one of the chief advantages for packet switching is it actually lowers the cost of our media because we no longer have to have to, we no longer have to have a dedicated pathway for our medias. Granted that we now have to share that centralized connection, what is the likelihood that any one person is going to overwhelm it? So, I mean, it's all about getting the most out of our equipment. 
It's kind of like last week when we talked about our broadband carriers. How we might have, if, assuming you have cable, you might have one connection coming into an area, to a community, and then from that centralized area, one cable going all the way to each of the homes in that area. All of the people that have cable connect back to that junction box, but then there's one cable from that junction box back to the cable company. It's the same concept here. So we've already talked about our lands, our mans, our wans. So now we're actually going to break, in, break them up into a little bit better definitions. Uh, normally we're talking about costs and we're talking about resource location. So a land, it's going to be the least expensive and it could span a small area. Now a single room or small building, it's too subjective to say that small. It's just we're going to share a local resource with one another. Man's a little bit more expensive and they can span a little bit larger of an area. WAN, most expensive, and it can span a heck of a lot wider than man's or lands. Basically, a WAN is a large collection of lands and man's put together. Okay. So each packet uh, is sent across uh, such of a network must contain some form of identification, some form of address. Without addressing, we really can't guarantee or with any level of certainty get information from one location to another. It's like when you mail a piece of uh, a letter off in the mail. If it doesn't have an address, it cannot get there. If it doesn't have a return address, it might not be able to get back to you if it's not deliverable. Or you want to you know, have them know who sent it. So within the uh, early 80s, the IEEE organization, uh, that's one of our big standards for anything electrical, they introduced Project 802. 802. whatever is actually typically our networking and communication standards protocol. So when we talk about our Ethernet, that's 802.3. If we talk about our wireless, that's 802.11. If we talk about our WiMAX, that's 802.16. Don't worry, I have a chart towards the end that breaks down our 80, uh, IEEE 802. whatever standards. Just because there's a lot of them. And each standard has very specific ways on how we communicate. IEEE is the most, uh, mostly comprised of, again, engineers who focus specifically on the lower layer, lower layers, that's layers 1, 2, and 3, and they actually deal with our electrical. They're not the only one. Uh, we have the World, uh, World Wide Web Consortium, we have the Internet Engineer Task Force, we have IANA, we have several organizations that control our networking. Have to let some bureaucracy sometimes, so. So, when we talk about World Wide Web Consortium, W3C, they are mainly focused with the internet and transport layer. When uh, we talk about IEEE, they're mainly focusing on the bottom layers. When we talk about uh, IETF, the Internet Task Force, they're mainly focused on the middle layers. This is just an example of what we're kind of locating uh, these different standard groups in as we talk about our textbook. So, let's talk about layer 2 some. So I already said that that was associated with our data link layer. This is where our frames are at. But this is actually one of the only layers that give us two sublayers. And that is our LLC, or logical link control, 
and our Mac or media access control layers. So our LLC, it actually deals with our multiplexing and our addressing. Our MAC address is access to shared media or media access control. Clever way to say MAC because the purpose of MAC is its name, media access control. Uh, but what does that mean though? So specifically the MAC layer uh, specifies how multiple computers share the underlining media, whether it be physical or or guided or unguided, uh, physical or non-physical, it's controlled by our Mac. So let's talk about the identification portion of our layer two model. Uh, well, this with our layer two model. Uh, we're going to talk about MAC addresses here in a bit, but we're going to talk about specifically our models and standards. Sorry. So here we talk about our category and subcategories. So like our 802 dot whatever. Our 802 is our main category. And then they might have subcategories and then sub subcategories. And here is the example of what I mean. 802.1. This used to be higher layer LAN protocols. 802.2, that's our link or logical link controller. 802.3, this is the one that most people are most familiar with, that's our wired Ethernet. 802.4 and 5, that's our token ring bus and hub, which both of those kind of don't exist anymore. 802.6, our MANs, don't really exist anymore. 802.7, our broadband LAN using coax, that doesn't really exist anymore. 802.9 and 10, those would be our LAN security and integrated services for our LAN, aren't really used anymore. 802.11, Wi-Fi, that's huge. 802.13, that's our CAT6, our Ethernet 6 cable, which actually gives us our 10 gigabit per second LAN connections. 802.14, that's our cable modem or modems. That's kind of subjective if it's disband or not because there are substandards for cable modem that still exists. 802.15, that's our wireless PANs, specifically Bluetooth. So here is a category, a subcategory, and a sub subcategory. 802.15, wireless PANs. 802.15.1, Bluetooth versus 802.15.4 Zigbee. Uh, what the hell is Zigbee? I have no idea. Bluetooth is one that I'm familiar with, but Zigbee, no. 802.16, our WiMAX. This is our broadband wireless accessory. That's our high level, high uh, frequency broadband. 802.17, that's our resilient packet ring. I'll let you read the rest because I covered the major ones that most people are associating with. I take that back. 802.20, that would be our emerging mobile brand, uh, broadband wireless access. That's a huge one that's growing in popularity. And as we need more, we just keep adding more sub uh, subcategories. Let's go back to our point-to-point -point multi access networks. What exactly does that mean? Point-to-point -point is one point to another point, and there is nothing in between. But if you have the internet, that is not point-to-point. -point. That is a point-to-multi-point-to-point. -point -to -point. Because as it goes to the internet, there is no direct dedicated path. This is an open pathway, so it can take multiple different paths. So sometimes we use the term multi-access. Multi-access is just 
our devices have the ability to access multiple devices. That's it. Now let's talk about our topologies. How do we conceptually lay these out? How do we organize them? How do we? Uh, how are they generally shaped? So we cover. There's not just four. There are several, but we cover just our basic four here. That's our bus topology, our ring topology, our mesh, and our star. So a bus is like a straight line. A ring is a ring. A star, everything connects to a centralized device. Lastly, which I know is the third one, not the last one, but I like to do mesh last. Mesh actually is all devices connected to all other devices. Then there might be a subcategory of mesh called a partial mesh. That's where some devices are connected to all other devices, but not necessarily all devices have to be. Here they are again. A bus is again one straight line. A ring is a big circle. A star is centrally connected. And the mesh, everything connected to everything else. Our bus topology usually usually consists of this one cable, and the end of that one cable is terminated. Basically, it goes in order, left to right or right to left, doesn't matter, but it goes down the wire. When it gets to the end of the wire, there's a terminated block there that sends the cable or the signal back the other way. Both ends have terminated blocks, and they just go back and forth. But because it's a bus, the computer that attached to the bus must coordinate when they're going to talk and who's, what rules are associated with talking, and things like that. The ring topology is a big closed loop that goes in order. Uh, they do some form of election. One person has a talking stick, and if you have the talking stick, you get to talk. And then it goes around the loop. But if there's ever a break in the loop, all communication then fails. So you can actually put two loops in there, or two rings in there, have a dual ring. That's one topology we didn't talk about, which is just a ring with two rings in it. Our mesh, uh, this is one of the issues with our mesh, is all devices are connected to all other devices. So let's say you have 30 computers, each computer has 30 connections. One connection per other computer. That'd be way too complex, way too expensive, way too many connections, and a huge mess. Next is our star. That is, everything is connected to a centralized point or hub. This is where our switch comes in, because we don't call it a hub anymore. Uh, a hub is a dumb switch. A switch is a smart hub. But basically it's a smart device in the center that is reliable so that we communicate through that. So why do we care for multiple topologies? There is no one shoe fits all. Thus, we have to have different topologies for different situations. Uh, realistically, nowadays, star or mesh or some form of star hybrid mesh are the ones that have taken over. So now let's get back to our packet identification, our demultiplexing, and our media access control addressing. So our MAC address. This is a physical address that's burnt in to our network interface cards. So where you plug in a, uh, the cable for your network connection to your computer, that's a NIC. Where you plug in your USB wireless controller, that's a wireless NIC. Whether it be built in or external, it doesn't matter. If you connect to a network, 
you have a network interface card. That card has an address associated with it. If we're talking about a data network, normally we're talking about a MAC address and a IP address. If you're talking about cell phones, they have a unique identifier that identifies them to the cell phone companies. Every device connecting to a network has some form of identification address. That way it can be sent and receive information on that network. So let's talk about, a little bit more in depth about our MAC address. Our media access control address consists of 48 bits. And that, again, is burnt into a network interface card. So how we uniquely identify this is the first three bytes, or 24 bits, are known as the organizational unique identifier. The last 24 bits, or 3 bytes, is the network interface controller. So uh, essentially, let's say you're 3Com. 3Com, the first 24 bits that all of their products will produce are going to be the same organizational ID, or OUID. And only the last 24 bits will change. That way, if you know the OUI, the Organizational Unique ID, you know who manufactured it. Now, if you have a problem with it, you can return it back to that manufacturer. So now, let's talk about the bottom of the screen. Unicast versus multicast, or global versus local. So, in the first group of 8 bits, the 7th and 8th bit, the 7th bit specifically, is it going to be local or is it going to be a global address? Essentially, is it going to be part of our LAN or part of our WAN? If it's part of our WAN, it's global. If it's part of our LAN, it's going to be part of our local. Our 8th bit, is it unique? Is it going to one device? Is it going to multiple devices? Or could it be going to more than that? So let's talk about Unicast. Unicast is a package or a packet going from one device to one other specific device. A broadcast is one device to all other devices. A multicast is one device to a select few of other devices. So I want to generalize this, just because it's, it's a little bit easier to generalize this one. So are you mailing a letter from one person to another person? Unicast, one. If you're mailing a letter blanketing an area, it'd be a broadcast. You're mailing it to everyone. Now let's say you want to mail the letter just to to guys, or just the girls in black shoes, or whatever is your criteria. That would be multicast. You don't mail it to everyone, but you don't mail it to just one. You mail it to a specific group of people. So, why is it that the first eight bits we were looking at just unicast and multicast? That's because broadcast is a specialized, if it's a broadcast, it's all ones. That means everything is all one, and our devices know that that means send it to everyone else. So now let's talk about our efficiency of our unicast, multicast, and broadcast. So broadcast and multicast are useful within a local connection, but not really that useful in a larger network. If we're dealing with a MAN or a WAN, it's just not as efficient. Because what happens in a LAN is all computers monitor the shared connection. All computers will 
if it's a broadcast, will extract the same packet and will examine it. If it's for them, they respond. If it's not, they drop it. But the fact that it was processed uses resources. Uh, the fact that it was looked at and then ignored uses resources. Thus, it's not very efficient to use on a larger network. So here is the basic algorithm is a packet derived over a LAN, extract the destination address from the packet. Does it match my address? If it does, do this. If not, is it a broadcast? If not, is it a bro multicast? If not, then ignore the packet. It will go through this process for every packet. So let's talk about more of our frames and framing, which this is chapter 9. We, we didn't do a lecture on, but within our textbook, that's the one dealing with our framing. And our framing typically is just, how do we know within our bits, large groups of ones and zeros, what's our beginning, what's our end? That's all framing is. Normally framing consists of a header, and a trailer, and some form of data, sometimes called a payload. That way we know where it begins, our header, we know that there is a payload or data, and then there is some form of trailer. That way we know exactly where it begins and where it ends. This is our frame. So. What size for, uh, si what's the size of this in bits or bytes? So, here is our measurement for our frame. Normally our header is 6 bytes. We also have a start of the header character that's just more of a like a hand waving going this is the beginning. Then we have an EOT, an end of transmission character. That's a hand waving goodbye. These are specialized, agreed upon signals that denote the beginning and the end of a message. In ASCII, the beginning handshake is a hexadecimal number of 211. And the EOT is a hexadecimal number of 204. That is just the agreed upon, if, it, if it's 204 in hexadecimal, that's a end trailer. If it's 201, it's our start. If that's, that is just our agreed upon, standardized agreement. So what happens if our data has more or less, more or values that might be 102 or 104. So the answer lies in a technique known as byte stuffing. This basically allows the transmission of the data without any form of confusion. Because if we're looking specifically at this 201 and we're also sending 201, it might get confused with why there are two start headers or why there are two end headers. So there has to be a way to organize our frames. Notice we just talked about bit framing. If our frame is agreed upon 150 bits and our start frame and our end frame might be 10 bits, we know that something is off. We should go with both. The 150 bits that we agreed upon our frame size would be plus looking at Roundabout, the beginning should be our 201, and our end portion should be 204. So essentially, it, the beginning one, so between 0 and 5 bits, we're looking for 201. At the 1490-ish uh, bits, we start looking for our 204. That way, anything between the other numbers, we don't get confused with. This basically allows us to 
Do our frame uh, delimiters basically so that we don't get confused and end the frame too soon? So basically, our SOH, our start and our end, are used to denote the beginning and end of a frame. We look for very specific portions within our payload. And that actually gives us very specific sequences so that we can make sure that we are sending and receiving the correct data. That way, if we double check and we accidentally did send an additional 201, the sequences don't line up, so the equipment just ignores it and processes it regularly, versus receives it and goes, oh, this is the start of a whole new frame. That is it for today. Uh, the bit and the byte stuffing is actually not an area that we deal with heavily. Uh, normally our equipment is smart enough, so we don't have to deal with that, but it's a good idea to un at least understand conceptually what it's talking about. If you uh, have any questions, please let me know. If there's anything else that I can do, again, please let me know, and I hope that you have a great day.